I'm Siobhan Amusa. And I'm Aphia de Volder. We're from the Tilburg Law Review, and we're here to discuss an issue that appears to have gained a life of its own over the last few years. Whether that's a new life or a new lease of life is certainly part of this exploration. But what we have seen is that it's an issue that appears to be at the forefront of the minds of many academics, especially within the legal field. The Tilburg Law School has been responsible for many global law initiatives, and the forthcoming Montesquieu lecture is certainly no different. It's entitled Intimations of Global Law. Intimations to describe global law may seem a little misplaced, given that law is what it is. But what many will tell you is that at the moment global law is all about feelings, suggestions and perhaps even insinuations. There is no definitive answer to what global law actually is. And it's for this reason that the Tilburg Law Review has decided to incorporate the topic of global law into its summer publication. And in addition to this special issue, we managed to secure an interview with the Montesquieu speaker of this year, a renewed professor who might be able to shed some light on the simple yet paradoxically complex question of what is global law. Professor Neil Walker, Regis Professor of Public Law and the Law of Nations and Nature at Edinburgh University, has kindly agreed to discuss with us some issues related to the topic. Hopefully this interview will allow us to move forward in this explicably challenging debate and give an answer to the other main question of this interview, global law. Is it just another case of the Emperor's clothes? So thank you Neil Walker for being here with us today. Um, we'll start with our first question, uh, which is um, that in recent times there seems to have been a lot of talk on a shift taking place within the nature of the state and ultimately sovereignty. In your mind, what is this shift and how is it related to what you've previously described as a newly emerging global legal configuration? Okay, uh, thanks for that question. The the. Probably the, the, the easiest way to, to, to begin to answer this from my perspective would be uh, first from a European perspective and then look beyond that to the global perspective. For years I worked in the European University Institute in Florence and, uh, and there I was introduced to a really quite radically Europeanized version of law and, uh, and the big debate when I was there ten years ago, five years ago, was the debate about the collision between national constitutional courts and the European Court of Justice. To some extent, the emphasis was on the German Constitutional Court, but also other national constitutional courts from Denmark, the House of Lords from the UK, the French uh, uh, Constitutionnel, etc., etc., uh, the Belgian Court. And the question was, uh, what did sovereignty mean? in the context of European integration. Uh, did sovereignty still mean the idea that the national uh, authority would have a monopoly of uh, legal authority, uh, would have the last word on the meaning of all legal provisions relevant to the state? Uh, or had we gone beyond that? Were we moving to a situation where uh, authority not only had been delegated to transnational institutions, such as the UN or, in my case, the EU, but had actually been transferred mm -hmm. irretrievably and irreversibly to these institutions. Now, of course, the interesting thing was that there was no clear answer to that question. It wasn't that it was easily resolved in everyone's mind. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was clear to me was that uh, if you spoke to people in national constitutional contexts, they tended to hang on to the old idea of national sovereignty. That's not just in Europe, that would be worldwide. Very prevalent in the United States, but also very prevalent in other continents as well. Uh, uh, but if you talked to the new transnational centres of law, like the Court of Justice at Luxembourg, or the political organs of the European Union in Brussels mm -hmm. uh, and elsewhere, then they had a different perspective about the supremacy of their law. Equally, if you went to the UN, or if you went to a lot of the international bodies in The Hague, or if you went to the other new regional centres in Africa and South America, again, you would have a sense of the shifting focus of legal authority. So, looking at this in a neutral way, trying to stand above that debate, and of course it's impossible to stand above any debate, trying to stand above that debate, what became clear 
was that uh, uh, it was uh, there really was a genuine conflict of perspectives that national authorities continued to think they were sovereign, but supranational authorities were beginning to think they had a degree of sovereignty as well. And so there was no position above these which could necessarily resolve that debate. So my understanding of it was, and I coined the term late sovereignty to describe this, was that late sovereignty was a situation where you could no longer talk about different sites of authority having exclusive and monopolistic legal authority, but what you could talk about was these different sites having autonomous and independent legal authority. It would be overlapping in legal authority, and these overlaps would have to be resolved in some kind of way. Mm -hmm. But we were now in a situation where, previously under the state-based system, legal authorities were state-based and therefore mutually exclusive, leaving aside imperialism, where what you would have would be a hegemonic power. Mm -hmm. so you would either have hegemonic imperial power, or you'd have mutually exclusive power. Mm -hmm. But in the new legal order, what you had instead was overlapping authorities and all sorts of competitions at the margins. One of my colleagues in, uh, in Florence, uh, uh, who, who actually was an advocate general at the Court of Justice, Miguel Maduro, <coughs> he once described this, I think he described it very well, he said, just imagine you're a Martian, you know, looking down on earth, and you look into national constitutional courts, and you hear what they're saying, then you look into Luxembourg and the Court of Justice, and you hear what they're saying, you can't make any sense of it, you can't reconcile it. They all think they're sovereign, they all think they're supreme. Mm -hmm. So that's the world in which we live. You know, competing conceptions of sovereignty over overlapping areas of jurisdiction. So I think that's one major change which has taken place. Okay. And is that um, specifically embodied in your term of newly emerging global legal, config legal configuration? Is that kind of what you mean? Yes, it's part of what I mean. I, I think the, the it's a negative part of what I mean, you know, okay. in the sense that, 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 that what we're saying is that, uh, that the old configuration was the sovereignty, the state sovereignty based one, the one which is often loosely and lazily called the, the Westphalian mm -hmm. uh, tradition going back to the 17th century treaty and peace of Westphalia. The idea that, uh, which of course was uh, an attempt to say that religious authority had been overcome by secular authority mm -hmm. and uh, each king was a secular authority within his own state and there was a recognition of this between the states mm -hmm. and so there was a kind of recognition of part of internal sovereignty was a mutual recognition of sovereignty between states. Now when that begins to break down with new forms of globalization, transnationalization of economic, cultural processes, etc., etc., increasing interdependence, the development of supranational authority, etc., you have this, this overlapping mosaic of authority. And uh, when I talk about the, the new emerging global legal configuration, uh, that probably makes it sound more ordered <laughs> than, it, than in fact it is. Uh, uh, in one of my papers, I actually talk about the, the disorder of orders. You know, the idea that what you have is not just all of these overlapping orders, but competing perspectives on the relationship between these orders. And for example, uh, international law has developed hugely in recent years. People have started talking about the constitutionalization of international law. Why? Well, one of the reasons they're doing that is that there's a recognition that there are more and more clashes between, say, international law, international human rights law, for example, and, uh, uh, and state law. Uh, and people's sense of legal order compels them to try to find some kind of secondary principle which will resolve relationships between these different sorts of legal orders. So they come up with new terms like uh, global administrative law, international constitutional law, terms which presumptively try to resolve these relationships, mm -hmm. often in favour of the higher order law. Mm -hmm. But, for example, some of the more pluralist approaches, which we'll talk about later, they also try to resolve the relationship between these, but not necessarily in favour of the higher order law. But uh, for someone like me, who spends uh, 
than life looking at this there's a there are many many examples many many ways in which people know uh, there's a whole market in ideas mm -hmm. for resolving what I call the disorder of orders some people are talk, talk about a universal <coughs> code of legality Patrick Glenn for example talks about the new common law which is much different from the old English common mm -hmm. law but it's based upon the idea that every positive legal system has a universal set of common law principles behind it uh, Jeremy Waldron has talked about the new use gentium, going back to the law of peoples, but saying this is a new idea which is finding its time again in the new age of international human rights law, etc. Mm -hmm. So what we have is a whole new vocabulary which is trying to make sense of the emerging global legal configuration. And the very diversity of that vocabulary is one of the features of that emerging configuration. So since we're talking about vocabulary, mm -hmm. terms like transnational, international, supranational, um, are they all um, part of global law? What makes global law different to these terms? Okay. Let, let's start by defining these terms. Sure, great. <laughs> uh, okay, so, uh, interesting. I mean, the supranational has always been used for uh, these very strong regional uh, legal regimes which somehow stand above the state and stand in a presumptively superior relationship to the state. So European law would be the paradigm case of that. But you know if you look at you know if you look at the African Union, if you look at Mercosur, if you even look at NAFTA, if you look at the World Trade Organization, if you look at the ECHR and the Council of Europe, you see at least tentative movements towards some kind of supranational law there. And what you need for supranational law is something like uh, a constitutional structure above the state. You probably need a court. You probably need uh, some notion of supremacy of the law. You probably need some kind of legislature to generate the law. You probably need some kind of executive body with some degree of discretion. So supranational law is not a it's, it's not a, an exact term, but it's about saying that when you're looking at the relationship between law beyond the state and law within the state, if the law beyond the state seems to be in a position to dictate mm -hmm. the relationship with the state, then you, you're moving towards supranational law. International law, as we well know, is the old-fashioned term for the law between sovereigns, the law between, uh, between states. Although there's an even older version of international law as use Gentium was a lot of peoples, where it was more a sense, already a sense of a kind of putative global law. But most people today would see international law as being uh, the, 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 the cousin to the notion of constitutional law. So within the Westphalian state-based system, internally you have constitutional law, externally law, externally you have international law between these different constitutional states. Uh, one of the interesting things that's happening is that the notion of international law itself has been remade, both public international law and also private international law. But traditionally, you know, international law is the old-fashioned term for the law between states. Transnational law is law which crosses states, where it's not necessarily mediated by the states. Mm -hmm. International law has to be mediated by the states. Supranational law has to be accepted by the states. It, both of these forms of law operate within what you might call the domain of public law. Transnational law doesn't. Transnational law could be the law of the internet. You know, it could be uh, it could be uh, uh, lex mercatoria. It could be the various tentative efforts mm -hmm. to have unified private law codes within Europe. Uh, it could be the law to do with football under FIFA, sports law, etc., etc. Uh, so transnational law is law which, in a sense, is impervious to boundaries. Mm -hmm. So it's a different kind of term. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's based upon the idea that it's a, a vertical set of relationships mm -hmm. which are cutting across. And so all of that is by way of introduction to what is global law. <laughs> 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 and is, is it a different type of law? Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, oh, I think... I think, uh, and this is something which I talk about in the lecture, 
so this is your sneak preview to my lecture. The 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 <laughs> the I think global law has two sets of meanings, you know, which have an interesting relationship to each other. One is uh, what you might call global level law, planetary law, if you want to call it that. that. What I call in the lecture globally extensive law. The idea of law which extends across the globe. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and what is true is that in much of the post-national legal thinking, mm -hmm. uh, there is an increasing attempt to think about global level law. Whether it be general principles of international law, Yushkogans, uh, whether it be uh, the idea of there being peak institutions, perhaps in the context of the reformed UN, whether it be in terms of uh, some of the things I already talked about, some of the attempts to, to, to rethink law in terms of a kind of global imagination, the notion of use gentium again, uh, or a notion of, 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 of a, some kind of universal common law. Mm -hmm. Uh, or what Klaus Günther calls a universal code of legality. He's a Habermasian scholar who believes that beneath every particular legal system there's a general code which allows all legal systems to communicate with each other. So there's no end of these sorts mm -hmm. of ideas. There's also more concrete ideas such as global constitutional law, global administrative law. And think of global administrative law for a second. What it says is that uh, if you look at any national administrative system, then you'll find that it will respect certain general principles, such as Audi uh, from Partum, always listen to another party, or no one should be a judge in their own cause, or the duty to give reasons, etc., mm -hmm. uh, etc. Et and what global administrative law says, why should we think of these as being rules which are confined to the state? Uh, there are many, many contexts where law emerges spontaneously in certain situations, say the law of the internet, uh, uh, where what you have is a, a system for regulating uh, the, uh, uh, the registration of names and numbers on the internet. Uh, what the global administrative lawyers are saying is that <coughs> regardless of the political provenance of these rules, surely given that each of these rules has a user community and a producer community, the sorts of logic which says that the duty to give reasons, the duty to hear the other side applies, should also apply in these sorts of areas. Mm -hmm. So this, then they add a dramatic adjective global to this, and suddenly you have the notion of a globally effective administrative law. So administrative law is no longer something which is locked within the state, mm -hmm. but it's something which is, which is globally effective as well. Uh, so even there what you have is a global dimension to it. Mm -hmm. uh, you also have global legal pluralism, which we'll come back to, but where the emphasis is on, on uh, the, the interface norms, you know, the, the oil which keeps a chain of global legality together. It's more about connecting the parts mm -hmm. than it is about having a hierarchy, mm -hmm. uh, looking all the way down. Uh, we also have what I call uh, the uh, new hybrid law, mm -hmm. which is where authors and thinkers are, are saying some of our old terminology, even of international law, is inappropriate. For example, Ruti Titel is well known for uh, her work on transitional justice. She's just written a recent book on the law of humanity. And what she's saying is that there's a shift within her thinking from, uh, from uh, uh, security as a hard physical concept to a notion of human security. And in areas as diverse as international criminal law, humanitarian law, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et There's a new merging towards what she calls a new law of humanity. Christine Bell, another person, she's talked about a new law of peace, which says there's a relationship between constitutional law and international law, backing each other up in transitional justice context mm -hmm. to developing new global rules of peace. So what you have there are not just different candidates for global law, but very, very different ways of thinking about how you even come up with the idea of global law to start mm -hmm. with. But the one thing they have in common is a notion of there being some kind of global level to legal principles. Mm -hmm. Now, alongside that, you have another notion which says that, that where, let's call it, global law becomes a three-dimensional rather than a two-dimensional concept. Mm 
but it's not just the surface of the planet. It's the, the idea that global law is, is something holistic, you know, something which includes the whole, right? You know, and, and that's the other and probably the more contentious use of the idea of global law. I think if you said to people, uh, yeah, there's a lots of interesting ideas and some practice around global law thought of as an extensive, an idea which is extending across the surface of the globe two-dimensionally, they say, yeah, yeah, I understand that, I can see this happening. If you say to people, no, we want you to start thinking about global law in three-dimensional terms as something which somehow takes in the entirety of the globe and relates all the different levels of global law together, I think people would be more concerned about it. They would say, where does this coherence come from? Is this a normative project? Is it a Western project? Mm -hmm. Is it a project of elites? Is it a project of the United Nations? What might this be? Mm -hmm. And my sense is that, uh, insofar as we can think about it, it's something less than that. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's a new it's a new paradigm of thought. You know, it's not a new concept. You know, global law isn't something which you know, we can find which somehow is going to you know, carve our way through everything else and show us how everything relates to each other. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a good way of naming a new paradigm of thought, a new orientation, where partly with reference to these global level laws, but also the intricacies of their relationships to other things, people increasingly, you know, think of the global whole as a global whole in terms of law. You know, my lecture is called Intimations of Global Law, and part, part of that is to try to suggest that this is something which is, as yet, very much unrealised. It's in a process of becoming, it will probably always be in a process of, of becoming. But today, we live in a world where, where, just because of the interconnectedness, which I mentioned earlier mm -hmm. in the European context elsewhere, we cannot pretend that national laws are mutually protected and compartmentalized. We know there's a global dimension to law, you know. We know that the law of humanitarian intervention, such as it may be, is a global issue. We know that, you know, the Arab Spring, such as it may be, is a global issue. We know that the, you know, the, 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 the sovereign debt crisis is a global issue. We know these things. We know the legal solutions to these have global permutations. Uh, someone talked about we live in an age of the of the global imaginary. We imagine ourselves not just as national subjects, but as global subjects. Many of the political movements of the last 40 years have been global movements. Mm -hmm. Feminism, uh, environmentalism. You can't say, you know, these started in one country or even developed a lot of their resonance in one country. These are ideas which almost by their nature circulate globally. Uh, also, uh, many of the uh, uh, many of the ideas that, that scare people in the modern age, global imperialism, global jihad, you know, people th think of them as global ideas. Mm -hmm. So there's a sense in which you know, part of our mentality, our starting position, is one which is actually quite global. And this is a point which is which is often, I think, uh, underestimated because your generation just takes it for granted. My generation has lived through it, probably more so, but if I think about how I think about law now, mm -hmm. as someone who has been doing this on and off for 30 years, it's very different. I'm a very different person from, mm -hmm. from, the, from the guy who did a law degree in Scotland uh, over 30 years ago who studied Scots law, who studied Scottish constitutional law, who studied UK constitutional law, who had a vague knowledge of something called Europe and something called international law, who then went to work in Florence, who discovered the intensity of something called European law, who started thinking about global law. But at the same time, you know, the world was changing. You know, the, the whole sense, you know, the way in which the, the global polity, let's call it, mm -hmm. was evolving was in a much, much more interconnected way. Mm -hmm. And so, just as, you know, if, 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 you grow, if you grow old with people, you don't see the changes. If you grow old with yourself, you don't see the changes. Mm -hmm. But there have been profound changes in my lifetime, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, which 
know, for example, I know Tilburg is going to start a new bachelor's degree uh, in global law. I mean, that would have been unthinkable uh, 30 years ago. That would have been a, some kind of spoof. Mm -hmm. you know, but today it seems interesting, innovative, certainly not ridiculous. Mm -hmm. you know, something which in many ways is part of the, of the zeitgeist. Thank you very much. So, these new changes that are taking place then, what do you think the challenges are and how do you think we can overcome them? Mm. <laughs> uh, oh, that's a life's work. <laughs> that's a life's work. I mean, what the, what the, one of the things I would say there is is the way that I think about globalization and global law is 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 that uh, it's not a bad thing or a good thing. It's bigger than that. It's just a thing, you know. It's it's, it's something which is happening. And of course, human agency is involved in all of these things, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, but you know, <coughs> let's face it: global law comes from so many different motives. You know, it comes from the motives of uh, transnational capital trying to facilitate itself. You know, many many of the critiques of the WTO, for example, are that it's simply the handmaiden for a certain type of, of uh, neoliberal transnational mm -hmm. order, which is a bit unfair. And of course, the reality is there's a, there's a political debate within the WTO mm -hmm. about what it is. Mm -hmm. But many of the other uh, transnational institutions which we talk about are precisely uh, uh, ways of trying to uh, overcome uh, or deal with or inhibit forms of private power which would otherwise easily escape from public authority into kind of a kind of transnational no man's land. Mm -hmm. Okay? So so global law, you know, is stands in a very complex dialectical relationship uh, with a whole range of global movements. And that whole range of global movements is really something which you have to describe as the emergence of a kind of global polity, not a state, but as a global polity, you know, where the same kinds of huge fault-buying debates which we've always had in the state, say between free markets, and solidaristic redistribution between right and left, or identity debates between cosmopolitanism and communitarianism, or the the emphasis upon cultural particularity. These two major fault lines of modern politics are now replicated, complicated, at a global level. You know, so global law and globalization isn't a good thing or a bad thing. It's 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 a it's a, it's, it's a description of the way in which these things are taking place and being reacted to. Now, clearly there are challenges here. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, there's a huge challenge of, of, of democratic deficit. Uh, the only supranational organisation which even comes close to making any kind of plausible democratic claim is probably the European Union. Mm -hmm. Except we know that it's constantly criticised for its democratic deficit. Uh, one answer to all of that is there's a huge democratic deficit within states. People don't vote, people are less interested in mm -hmm. politics. People realise that the states are deciding on things, or other states are deciding upon their fate, and so the state itself you know, isn't enough for your democratic voice to be vindicated. But none of that, the fact that states themselves are in a perfect situation, doesn't mean that we shouldn't worry about the lack of transnational democracy. Mm -hmm. So that's one major issue. Another major issue is cultural universalism versus cultural relativism. You know, uh, do you look at the debate over international human rights? And uh, there's a tremendous clash between those who see uh, the universality of international human rights as being a very, very good thing about global law and those who see it as being the hegemon of the West, mm -hmm. imposing their idea of order. Now, you know, we're used to universality, particularity debates within states. You know, take France, for example. It has the history of 
of trying to impose some abstract universal notion of citizenship mm -hmm. upon what is quite a multicultural community. You know, the, the whole idea of the, the community is the state has been like, has been neutral. That's been a very, very controversial. Uh, but you multiply that to the global level and it becomes all the more controversial. The stakes are much higher on all sides. So there's all sorts of issues there. There's also an issue of, I think, the very idea of, of some kind of general authority. Uh, I don't mean by that a world government, but, but I think one of, the, one of the features of our modern understanding of law is, and it's very much a modern understanding of law, and by that I mean coinciding with the development of the nation state in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. It's a post-medieval understanding of law. It's an understanding of law which says that the world is something which we can make over in our own terms. We are effectively in charge of our own destiny, which is a secular destiny. People might still have their religious faiths, but nevertheless, the game of politics, the world of politics, is about people collectively taking charge of their own destiny and deciding what that destiny might be. Now, under the Westphalian system, that works for some people, at least. There's a notion of mutually exclusive order. You get to make your world within its own space. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it doesn't work if you're that part of the world, you know, which is who are the the victims of the imperialism of the Westphalian order, which is always the, the dark side of the Westphalian order. The, it was never about every state in the world. It was intended to be about European states. But nevertheless, there is a notion there that for some people that modernist idea makes sense. The problem with globalism and globalization is that no one no one writes the script anymore within the global legal order, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and there is no way, therefore, that we can imagine that we are collective writers of a single script. Thank God some people would say or oh, his secular equivalent. But the uh, the danger then is that it's seen as something which is out of control, that people are buffeted by all sorts of forces, including legal forces, which they're not necessarily controlled by. You know, So again, one of the challenges of global law is how do we reconcile its fecund diversity with some notion that law is still something that we are the collective controllers of. So these are incredible challenges. And they're not going away. You know. There'll be challenges for, for your generation as well. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Could you describe the idea of constitutional pluralism and how it could benefit uh, the debate about global law? Okay. I mean, constitutional pluralism is, 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 is a notion which uh, I've been associated with in, 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 in my work. And again, yeah. it's one which... Uh, originated in the in the European context. But I think what is central to the notion of constitutional pluralism is a mixture of a recognition on the one hand that uh, states continue to have uh, a high degree of investment in the control of their own law and a recognition on the other hand you know, that they have to sometimes listen to external authorities uh, who may, on certain subjects, have a greater degree of legitimacy. The idea of constitutional pluralism isn't just about states, it's about any, let's call it any regime. It could be a state regime, it could be a transnational regime, it could be a global regime. And uh, it's about them showing each other mutual respect, accepting the inevit inevitability of an overlap between different systems, and trying to find some kind of meta rules or rules at the margins which can, can resolve this. So let's take an example, let's take the, the famous Caddy case uh, which was, uh, I'll, I'll say something about it because your audience probably doesn't know about it but it's been a famous case over the last few years. It was a case which came before the, the European Court of Justice and what Caddy was about was whether or not uh, the, whether or not European law uh, what should the relationship be between European law and United Nations resolutions when it came to uh, 
confiscating the assets of people who were on the lists as terrorist suspects after 9-11. Okay? So what we had were all these UN rules, which were very, very strong about the confiscation of, of assets, and which uh, uh, sought to impose these regulations upon both national and regional authorities for, for security purposes. And the question was whether the EU had any autonomy simply to say, to say we are not going to accept the imposition of UN rules here. And how it was resolved was, it, was the EU said, well, we are a policy in our, in our own right. We believe in something called European values. We have our own notion of democracy. We have our own notion of integrity. We also have our own fundamental rules about uh, uh, freedom of property, freedom of information, etc., etc. So we do not accept this blanket uh, uh, a resolution from the UN. Now, so that's an example of what I would call constitutional pluralism, where the, the European Court did not disregard the global authority of the UN. They recognised that the UN was resolved, was involved in some kind of global security situation. They didn't say that's pointless and meaningless. But what they said was, what we have to do as a European Court is not just think about what we want to do, but think about the relationship between our constitutional values and other constitutional values that we might find ourselves in some kind of clash with. So what you're asking courts to do, try to think of a way of describing this, what you're asking a court to do in that situation is somehow to kind of stand outside itself and say, I'm not just a guardian of this legal order, I'm also an interlocutor in a global legal order. You know, where we have to think about the relationship between what we do and what others do. Let's take another example, the German Constitutional Court, which over the last six months has had to resolve all sorts of cases about the authority uh, of Germany uh, to be involved in uh, financial restructuring plans around bailouts of Greece, Spain, etc., etc. There's all sorts of provisions within you know, the German Constitution which safeguard the federal principle, the democratic principle. And the German Constitutional Court has said, you know, that in these sorts of situations, you know, if uh, the executive is going to sign Germany up for arrangements which will involve the significant transfer of fiscal resources to other states, then these things have to go through the national parliament, even though that might make them politically impossible. And what it has to do is it has to find some kind of balance between respecting that idea that fundamental to the idea of German constitutional authority is the democratic will of the German people with the notion that the European Union cannot survive you know, unless there's some idea of fiscal solidarity between the states. So you know, you're asking courts to be both custodians and mediators at the same time. And that might seem an impossible thing to do, but I think increasingly that's what we do ask courts to do. Let me take one final example. The Canadian Constitutional Court uh, years ago had to look at the question of the secession of Quebec uh, from Canada. Now the Constitutional Court in that case, its job is partly as a custodian of the Constitution. And under the Constitutional rules, uh, Quebec had no unilateral right to secede. But what Quebec's argument was, was part of the historical argument about the legality of the Canadian Constitution, but there was also an argument which said, if you are the unhappy part of a federation, then one of the things that you might be unhappy about are the very rules of the breakup of the federation. Mm -hmm. And so if the people of Quebec unilaterally get to a situation where they want to decide that they want to be part of another constitutional entity, then surely you have to take that seriously, notwithstanding what the, the rules of the game actually are. And what the Canadian Constitutional Court said was, said, yes, we have to think of ourselves as, as custodians of the Canadian Constitution, but we also have to think of ourselves as implicated in a plural situation, right? Mm -hmm. Where there's a relationship between the Canadian people and some other category of people, putatively, the Quebec people. And so what we are introducing is a new expectation, a new duty, a new obligation on the part of the Canadian government to negotiate in good faith 
prospects and the possibility of independence. In other words, they should not set their stall against this. They should not use narrow legalistic objections against a Quebec referendum, etc., etc. So it's a very good example of a court standing outside its role as custodian of a particular constitutional order, recognise that it exists in a situation of constitutional overlap and constitutional plurality, and taking on this additional mediating role. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I've given you a few examples of how that might work. You know, and one of the things about it is that there's a kind of... It's very difficult, because sometimes the next question, to anticipate your next question might be, mm -hmm. but how, how do you actually generalise what these principles should be? Mm -hmm very, very difficult thing to do. It's a very difficult thing to do because if there were another set of general principles above the constitutional rules, then we'd be getting globalism in that kind of top-down way. What, what we're talking about here is just a, an openness of constitutional courts you know, to the fact that there are other constitutional entities, there are other polities with their constitutional values as, as well, and that it's no longer the role of a supreme court within a legal order to have the last word to batten down the hatches to say it's this legal order against all the other legal orders in the world. Increasingly it's the role of the last and top court to actually mediate the relationship between its legal order and other legal orders. Mm -hmm. So that in a nutshell is what constitutional pluralism offers. Yeah. So uh, what in what way do you think, if we we are talking about all the um, all the changes that are taking place and uh, all the developments that are there with the, with the global law, um, how do you think we should implement or we should integrate this in uh, education? Legal education. How is it changing for uh, for our future students? Oh, big question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it changes in all sorts of ways. I mean, I think I think. Uh, we all know, I mean, if we go back to that distinction I drew earlier between uh, global level and uh, the, the, the kind of globally holistic, there's a difference between programs which think about global law as a single entity, uh, I'll come back to that in a moment, but also what you might call global level, that is new global networks. Uh, so uh, this week, uh, this idea of the... the, the, the the, the Global College of, of Law Schools, which has been launched at Tilburg. Uh, there's other networked ideas. You can think of old European ideas like Erasmus, etc. Okay, it wasn't global, but it was European. The, the idea of, of let's say, multi-centred legal, either institutions of professional practice or institutions of, of education. So that's one way. But the more interesting question is, is the actual object of the education itself mm -hmm. in what sense might that be global? I think what I would say to that is, is that it's a, what you have to do in any legal education, I think, is somehow be aware of the fact that the calling something global and is not mutually exclusive with recognising that everyone still operates within the national jurisdiction. Okay, so for example, one of the one of the best global law journals mm -hmm. is something called the German Law Journal, which is an online journal uh, run by a friend of mine. I'm not saying it's one of the best because it's run by a friend of mine, but it, it is a guy called Piers and Manson who's also at this uh, uh, seminar. Uh, now. It's a wonderful idea because what it does is it says that, first of all, it's in the English language, which is wonderful for, wonderful for Anglophones because they get all these insights into German law. But it's not about German law. It's about German law meets the world. Mm -hmm. you know, it's about how, how law looks like from the perspective of Germany, which is a very, very different thing from German law. Right? Mm -hmm. So what it says is that from the perspective of Germany, German domestic law is important, but just as if not more important is the relationship between German domestic law and European law, German domestic law and ECHR law, German domestic law and WTO law. law. Also, no interested legal German could be uninterested in other relationships, say between 
British and Dutch constitutional law and EU law or ECHR law because that will impact upon them in this interconnected world as well. So there's a sense that that uh, that that globality is about deep interconnectedness, okay? But it still comes from a particular perspective, right? That uh, that you only get the. In other words, what makes law global from that perspective is not that there's some view from nowhere, mm. you know, which is the global view as opposed to the national view. Is that all of the national views and all of the regional views now incorporate a global dimension? Mm. Okay, so I think that's very very important. Now. Uh, that means, I think, that probably there is still going to be a better future or an easier future for global law programs, which see themselves as looking both at a domestic legal system and looking from the perspective of that domestic legal system at the world, looking at things globally, than there would be for programs which are purely global. Mm. Now, I know Tilburg, for example, is going to develop a, a global masters, mm. and uh, but partly in recognition of that, that global masters will not, uh, or global bachelors, bachelors uh, yes. will, will not qualify these people as Dutch lawyers. That's all right, provided you know there's a recognition that the totality of legal education will continue to ha incorporate both a domestic dimension and a global dimension. But I think. Probably, in a normal way, what is more likely to happen is that increasingly people's uh, legal education will incorporate, uh, a larger percentage of it will be, in the model of the German Law Journal, will be looking at things beyond the state, international law, transnational law, aspects of private law, whether it be contract, tort, whatever, which are more international in nature, often without even, you know, uh, naming it as such, because mm. often these things are just kind of deeply implicated in the changing practice of these different sorts of subjects. One, one other thing which I think is important here is that it's probably linked to certain ways in which we are, we are, uh, we are changing uh, the way that we think about legal education. You know, I think legal education probably increasingly is not so much about people learning a canonical body of knowledge, right? Like when I was educated, you had to know, you know, 230 contract cases which were vital, you had to know, you know, 70 criminal law cases, etc. And obviously that remains important, but one of the reasons why you had to have such knowledge in your fingertips was that we didn't live in a, uh, in, in a computerised age, you know. So... Uh, you actually did have to internalise knowledge, you know, uh, in many ways because it wasn't going to be readily accessible. Now I think one of the things that legal academics are much better at, including young legal academics, is simply knowing how to access information. And so an awful lot of education is now about the combination of understanding general principles and understanding the methodologies of accessing information. And if you do that, if you, if you shift, shift legal education in that direction, I think it allows you, you know, to have a wider horizon, a wider perspective on the sorts of subjects you can do because you're not having to spend all your time learning all the rules, mm -hmm. okay? Now, that might be controversial to some people, but I think, you know, to some extent, to some extent that's, that's, the, that's, that's how it might change. So then it's like... Um you have a focus on national legislation, but then more in the abstract form. Because if you, yeah. I can imagine that once you are still, for example, um, your focus is on Dutch law, this is your starting point, and then you look at the, how it relates to all the other fields or relevant fields of law, then you still are kind of limited. Because the first thing that you learn is also the first thing that is forming you, that is molding you. And I think one of the, the the advantages would be to have more um, knowledge about the different national systems rather than one system in itself. I agree. So what do you think I, I, about I, I, that? I'm not against that. I'm, ju I'm just saying that, that part of part of 
It's a complicated point. I mean, I, part, part, part of that more global self, global awareness is, is, is an awareness of both transnationality and other systems. Mm. So it's both comparative and transnational. So if you look at an online journal like Global Jurist, it still very much describes itself as a comparative, not journal, interestingly. It doesn't describe itself as a transnational journal. And I think one of the reasons it does that is, is that there's a recognition that in practice if you're going to be a good lawyer, then you actually have to know about other national systems. It's not just about transnational law. But also there's a recognition that, that, that self-understanding comes from being, being, being able to situate yourself in a kind of comparative continuum in a comparative context. You know, I mean, I understand an awful lot more about what it is to be a Scots lawyer or even a UK lawyer through having had a lot of access, exposure to continental legal systems. You know, I understand the significance of common law precedent, custom, parliamentary sovereignty far more by seeing it in sharp relief against the alternatives. Mm -hmm. So I think it is important to understand other systems. What I would insist upon, though, is that you know that people people are still primarily located within a particular system. That doesn't mean that they have to somehow unproblematically inhabit the worldview of that system. It just means that people are rooted somewhere, mm -hmm. you know. And it may well be that eighty percent of what they're doing, eighty percent of what you're doing, is a contract lawyer in America. It's the same as eighty percent of what you're doing is a contract lawyer in Germany, or whatever. But you're still rooted somewhere else. There's still a different set of perspectives there. Like, related to that, I think maybe another implicit in your point is that one of the features of globalization of law is is also kind of differentiation or segmentalization, that it becomes more important uh, to be a contract lawyer, say, than it does to be a German lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that's true, I think, to some extent, you know, and that, that's part of what the globalization of legal education actually does, is that there's more and more emphasis. You know, I see my, you know, in Edinburgh, for example, is very strong in intellectual property law. And I see my intellectual property colleagues, and they don't, they don't think of themselves as very much as Scots lawyers. They think of themselves as, 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 as IP lawyers. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, particularly in the, in, the, uh, in, in the internet age, you know, and uh, an awful lot of their examples... Uh, their thinking is drawn from transnational context, and uh, it's not, uh, uh, and they don't, they don't show that. You know, they just it's just taken for granted. It's just done naturally. So there is that aspect to it as well. You know, and that's in recognition of the fact that probably more and more lawyers will be people who specialise in particular areas. However, I think there's a balance there. You know, I think there's a balance there. I think both practically, there's always going to be an awful lot of people who see themselves as general practitioners, so to speak. And so they need that holistic understanding of their own legal system. For them too, it becomes increasingly important that they understand how their system operates with the world. Yeah. But it's also important that you have people who understand the national system as a whole as well, you know. Because at the end of the day, you know, law is also a political object, it's also a political product of a national system. You know, mm -hmm. people shouldn't just see themselves as being, you know, people who just happen to be locally situated lawyers of some sort of transnational practice. Often it's important, you know. For example, I know a, a lot of my friends are criminal lawyers, and many of them are very good transnational criminal lawyers, but the very best of them. Uh, I think still have a very, very close understanding of what is distinctive about their national order, historically, but also in a contemporary way, and how their national criminal law fits into, say, notions of fault, which you might find within civil law, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So you still, an awful lot of legal self-understanding is still nationally based as well. You know, That's why I want to insist that the, the global lawyer is someone who somehow, you know, Supplements, supplements is maybe too little, but sees it as a, a merger of a national perspective and a global perspective. Mm. Okay. Um, you were talking earlier already about cultural imperialism and, or cultural relativism, and yeah. um, 
what for me is quite interesting in this whole discussion is that it appears to be somehow a bit of a Western way of thinking, the whole idea of global law. And I'm very curious where you would think um, that, for example, an African researcher or an Asian researcher would say about the whole concept of global law. Yes. And who am I to answer that question? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, clearly, there's always a double bind. There's a paradox in these sorts of debates. You know, you, both in, in the general global law debate, but also saying something like global human rights, uh, which I've been writing about recently. Because either you treat these as Western concepts, which may have the virtue of some kind of honesty, right? Uh, but also has, you know, a terrible arrogance. You know, it's like these Western concepts, you know, nevertheless, uh, are treated as the master concepts, which have to frame everything else. Or you, you, you genuinely uh, put them forward as global concepts, you know, which has the the danger of being a fraud. Okay, it's something which actually is Western and is dressed up as global. But it has the virtue of at least aspiring to be global. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the global human rights debate, for example, you know you look at uh, some uh, some of the different positions on the universality of human mm -hmm. rights. So, someone like Amartya Sen, for example, says, "Look, human rights is is a genuinely global discourse," mm -hmm. uh, and the important thing is not to bang on about cultural difference, but to understand that if you are an Asian talking about this, then it's incredibly important to pursue certain sorts of rights, uh, economic and social rights, which have never been at the centre of the Western canon, mm. but which are compatible with, and which have been at least uh, uh, contentious parts of the Western canon. If you go back to 1948, you know, and the USSR saying social and economic rights should come before first generation classic liberal freedom rights, mm -hmm. saying that any tradition is more open to struggle than you think it is. So rather than saying give up on that tradition, it's it's an unreconstructed Western tradition. See the tradition itself as being something very very open mm -hmm. and something which can be can be can be participated in, added to, become genuinely globalised. Now that's one view. There's another view, someone like Upendra Baxi, for example, would say, no, some of these traditions are just, they're deeply hardwired, it's in their DNA, mm. that they, they put the individual first. Mm. You know, that there's a, there's a deep celebration of the liberal, autonomous individual within this, you need a you, you, it's not about changing human rights, it's about needing a, view, a new vocabulary. Okay? Mm. Now, my view is more the first view. Okay? Mm. I do think, I don't think that any of these concepts is so unreconstructable. Mm. I don't think that. You know? And I don't think of, I think we all have a moral duty to say what is the least worst way of proceeding. Mm. And for me, the least worst way of proceeding is always to start with the imaginable. And the imaginable for me are the better and more progressive discourses that we have transnationally, including discourses of global human rights, but also discourses of, say, uh, global parliamentarianism in terms of the UN, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not a great advocate of a global parliament. I'm just saying that, for me, the more constructive debates are the ones which are often inaugurated by the global south, you know, which precisely try to come to terms with concepts which may have started or which may know their history in the West. But the point I would make is that often their Western history is more a history of struggle, it's more of an open history mm -hmm. than is often conceded by those who are critical of Western hegemony within these debates. Okay, but so then it's more the whole process of globalization of law uh -huh. is just at the same time you see the same process of regionalization. Yes. So, in the end, 
global law uh -huh. is maybe something we will never attain. De depends what you, you mean by... Okay, so let, 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 let me come back to some of the things I was saying mm. you know, at the beginning. Uh, this idea, this distinction between globally extensive law and global, two-dimensional global oh, yeah, law yeah. and, and three-dimensional. Okay, I, I think we cannot, we cannot deny that today there is more globally extensive law, either at the hard level of doctrine, world order treaties, etc., etc., okay, or in terms of the way that people are thinking about it, kind of breakthrough, uh, breaking ideas, you know, mm -hmm. of uh, whether it be global administrative law, etc., etc., which aren't just academic inventions. They're not just academic inventions. They're attempts to come to terms with certain hiatuses, certain gaps within global legality. Okay? Mm -hmm. So there is a global level. Now, the notion of a global law, what I'm saying is that we should not, not, neither think that it is the aim to have a single global law or a single global legal system, nor should we think that it stands there as some kind of regulative ideal against which we can criticise actual practice. Mm. What I'm saying, though, is that increasingly in the world there's a paradigm shift, you know, that people are thinking, they're situating themselves as legal scholars and legal thinkers and even legal practitioners in a world which is globally connected, right? Mm. Okay? And that's not going to go away. Mm. That idea is not going to go away. The way in which that's contested, you know, the way in which uh, uh, the way in which these matters are resolved and not resolved. For example, f it's hard to imagine anyone in my lifetime or your lifetime who's interested in human rights, for example, who will not have to constantly revisit the very subject which I just talked about there. That is, what is the relationship between the universal and particular? What's the relationship when we're talking about cultural relativism? How seriously do we take group rights? How seriously do we take race hate law? Mm. How, 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 how seriously do we take religious hate law? What's the relationship between dignity, freedom of expression? Questions about uh, uh, reproductive freedom, etc., etc. These questions are going to go away. And every time we address these questions, we're not just going to be asking ourselves moral questions about what's the right answer. We're going to be asking ourselves kind of metamoral questions about who gets to decide what's the right answer. Okay? Mm. These questions aren't going to go away. They're not easily going to resolve themselves, but they're questions which necessarily impose themselves upon us mm. because of the new global horizons of law. Right? That's all I mean by yeah. law having a global paradigm. Yeah. You can't get away from these sorts of things. And it's a good thing mm. that people can't get away from that. Because, you know, at least that way you know, there's a sense that it comes back to some of the things I was saying about constitutional pluralism. You know, that that lawyers have to see themselves increasingly as people who inhabit the in between spaces, between different systems, between different cultures, and who don't just have to defend, they're not just custodians, they're also mediators, they're also people between these different sorts of orders. I mean that might sound very, very vague and it is. But I think it's the inevitability of you know of of, of of the global horizon that people have to con continuously situate themselves there. And there's some very, very positive things out of that as well. You know, the attempt, for example, to think about global administrative rules. Mm -hmm. You know. So what you do there is that you you start with some ideas and say, Okay, can we push the envelope? You know, mm -hmm. can we actually get any agreement? for the applicability of these rules at the global level. Maybe not. You've got to start from somewhere. You yeah. have to start with these sorts of ideas. And knowing that, it's, you're, you're, that, that what you're doing is not simply invoking traditional, it's not traditional authority anymore. It's more, it's more a form of kind of entrepreneurship of mm. ideas. You're pushing certain ideas and seeing how successful they might be you know, how adaptable they might be to, to new global contexts. I mean, of course there's a downside to this as well, that there's a whole rhetoric around globalism and global law and, you know, everyone jumps on the bandwagon, mm. you know. 
And uh, there's some, someone once, uh, a well-known scholar, John Elster, uh, uh, once talked about the what he called the civilizing effect of hypocrisy. <laughs> and what he meant by that is that often uh, uh, we have ideas imposed upon us mm. uh, because they become part of the uh, 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 become part of a, of a culture. So take 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 in European law, for example. Here's two notions: uh, European citizenship and subsidiarity. You know, two notions which are central to European law. At the time they were coined, no one really knew what they meant. What does subsidiarity mean? This is something which comes from church law. What does it mean? What is European citizenship? Seems like an oxymoron. We're national citizens. What does it mean? So, uh, so some people, now within that debate, you would have uh, people who would take it seriously, who genuinely were interested in these, in these as, as kind of code-breaking ideas. Then you'd have other people who would say, oh, no, this is a rhetoric of the day. We have to deal, we have to deal with it. Mm. But all of these people have to operate within a public domain. And so if you're operating with new notions, then whatever your motivation might be, okay, the very fact that you want to be a plausible contributor to a debate has a civilizing effect. Okay? Mm. So I'm not one of these people who say that you know, the emperor has no clothes, mm. uh, uh, that, that global law can't mean anything because people are just jumping on a bandwagon. They're not. They're jumping on, they're jumping on a debate which has more or less cynical, more or less cynical input from all sorts of different parties. And if they want to be serious participants in that debate, they have to participate in, in it at its highest level. Mm. Otherwise, they will not be effective participants within that debate. So, for example, if someone started a global law program tomorrow, which was 95% domestic law and 5% uh, foreign law, then no one, people would think, no, that's not what we mean by global law mm. anymore. Or if someone started a global law program, which simply was about you know, the, the global transposition of Western values, then there would be immediate objections, because people are attuned to the sensitivities and the subtleties surrounding the subject more mm. than, than perhaps once they were. So, so yes, global law is to some extent still a shot in the dark. It's about people, you know, entering a field, sometimes opportunistically, sometimes not, mm -hmm. trying to make a fast buck or trying to make an intellectual reputation quickly, but sometimes not. But I think many, many debates within law are like that. And, you know, and in a sense, I think the debate has its own momentum and it has its own development. I think there are genuine, pos genuinely positive things to be achieved through this. Okay, thank you.